Would you turn, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15? The Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Now remember the meetings through the week, God willing and weather permitting. We'll be here each night up until Friday evening at 7.30 and then on into next week. God willing, no meeting on Saturday night. Luke chapter 15 and verse 1. Then drew near unto him, that is to the Lord Jesus, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them. In his book, Talking the Winner's Way, the author Lyle Lowndes talks about a friend of his who is a professional artist. He does caricatures. He does especially caricatures of well-known people, and he does that for magazines like Newsweek and Rolling Stone. And his friend told him that when, of course, when you're doing a caricature, you've got to catch something about the person, about their appearance or their personality, that when he does that, the people who he is drawing I think he's missed the mark completely. They don't see any similarity, any resemblance. But the friends of the person say, you nailed it, that, that, that's him. And of course, the idea is we all have our own opinions. We have, all have our own self-image of what I am like. That's what's happening right here. There's a clash. There's a, there's a crash taking place in Luke 15 because the Pharisees and scribes had their opinion of themselves. And I can tell you, that we're probably as correct about what we're like as the number we give when somebody asks us how much we weigh. <laughs> our, opinion, our opinion about ourselves is vastly different from what we are really like. And in this chapter, the Lord Jesus responds. This is one of the most important chapters in our Bible, Luke chapter 15. It's Christ's portrait of God, of the triune God. And we, we have it, we owe it, humanly speaking, to the accusation of these enemies of the Lord who said this man receives sinners. Now the Lord Jesus responds to that by answering two vital questions. He shows them in this parable, it's a parable of three parts. He shows them number one, who are sinners? He's receiving sinners, well, who are sinners? And that includes the Pharisees and scribes even though they don't realize it. Then he shows them the kinds of sinners he receives and that excludes the Pharisees, not by Christ's choice, but by their choice. He shows them that there are people who do not come to the Lord Jesus because they think they're fine the way they are. So I just very briefly at the beginning of the meeting, I want you to notice, first of all, how these two sons at the end of the chapter, how they live, and then how the story ends when the Lord Jesus is finished with the parable. The man that we call the prodigal son lived as though his father were dead to him. He said, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. I want to live now as if you had already died and I had received my inheritance. So he wanted to live as if his father were dead and gone. And it is a picture of sinners, unrighteous sinners, because there are many people who claim to believe in God and they believe that God exists and that they, they, they live and they sin as though there were no God, as though there were no supreme being that they would have to meet one day. That's the prodigal. His older brother, the proud son, he wanted to live, at least in his mind, as though his father was indebted to him. He had done so much for his father. His father should be very lucky. He thought that he has a son like me. So these are two vastly different boys, and you'll see that they picture for us the two classes at the beginning of the chapter. There are the scribes and Pharisees who thought that really they had done God quite a bit of good favors by how they were living. And then there were the publicans and sinners who knew they were sinners and were coming to Christ. Now, the first one reminds us of people, I say, who live as if there were no God. The reason why this applies to all of us, you've met people like this, haven't you? Like these two boys. And if you were honest, you would have to admit that you can see something of these two boys in your own heart. The reminder every now and then that we have sinned and the idea that really we're not as bad as other sinners. 
That's pictured by these two sons. Because there are people who live and their standards are their own. Right and wrong is decided by what they think is right and what, by what they think is wrong. Now, please understand me that sin and guilt are real things. They are not figments of the imagination. They are not creations of society. Sin is a real thing. It is against God. Every sin that is committed is first and foremost, primarily against God. That is why David, who sinned against a woman, who sinned against her husband, who sinned against his army, who sinned against the nation, said to God, it is against thee and thee only that I have sinned. It wasn't that he was somehow imagining he hadn't sinned against others. It was that the sin that was against God was so overwhelming that it just completely captivated his thinking as he realized that he had sinned against the great God of heaven. In the 1970s, Paul Pot tried to turn Cambodia into his idea of a communist, socialist, agrarian society. Let me tell you what was involved in that. Anybody who had any education was immediately murdered. If you spoke a foreign language, you were murdered. If you had a wristwatch, you were murdered. Any indication that you had any schooling, any indication that you had any technology, you were murdered. Those who were not murdered by the millions were marched out of cities and sent out to farms where they would almost starve. And the Khmer Rouge was enforcing the vision of this man conservatively, he was responsible for 1 million deaths. When he was tried, his statement afterward was, my conscience is clear. My, 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 my conscience is clear. His conscience was clear because he had lived by his own standards. Now, now, none of us is a mass murderer, but each of us has our own ideas of what is right and wrong, but you must understand that when we meet God, he's not going to judge you or me by what we think is right or wrong, but by his standards. People who think there's no God or people who live that way, imagine that they have no sins to answer for, that there will be no meeting with God in eternity, that they will not be subject, as John Paul Sartre said, to the unremitting gaze of an almighty God, that eyes are watching, that God sees, that God knows, that God records everything that we do. When I was a young boy growing up in Sunday school and in gospel meetings, there were a lot of things that should have stirred my young heart. There are many things. I look back now and there are many things that should have deeply, deeply resonated in my heart and shattered my false sense of peace. But the one thing that did get through, that carved its way into my memory, that, that etched itself on my mind, was the understanding that one day I would have to meet God. And I would stand before that God who knew everything about me and every sin I had ever committed, sins that my parents knew nothing about, that my siblings knew nothing about, every sin that I had ever committed, I would have to stand before God with those sins brought to the light. Please understand, sin is real. Judgment for sin is real. Facing those sins in eternity is real. Men and women rarely think about dying and about where they will go. And Landers, the older ones will recognize that name. But Ann Landers very wittily and very knowledgeably answered scores and scores and scores of questions in the newspaper. People would write in about anything, their family, uh, interpersonal relationships, uh, marriage life, schooling, everything. And she had an answer. Generally very cogent and frequently very witty, except once. Somebody wrote in and asked her, what do you think about heaven and hell? And this knowledgeable, prolific writer said, that's something I haven't given much thought to. That's something I haven't, haven't given much thought to. So she did give her mind to thinking about interpersonal relationships, 
about counseling married couples, about raising children. She gave her mind to thinking about how to succeed in business and give people sound financial advice. And yet you mean to tell me that the single most important thing in the life of any human being, she didn't give much thought to? How about you? Have you given much thought to where you're going to be when you die? Because every one of us one day is going to step from this world into eternity. But like this boy, many people live as if there were no God. But of course, the second son reminds us of people who live as if there were no guilt. They've lived in such a wonderful way that they just feel their sins are much less than other people. If they've ever done anything wrong, it's very minor and can hardly be considered. It's like it's like the speeder who's doing 70 in a 65 zone and he watches people go by and doing 80 and 85 and he figures to himself if anybody's going to get pulled over it will be it will be them not me i'm I, i'm only five miles above the speed limit i'm within walter gustafson's uh you know safe zone so i'm okay but you see god's pulling everybody over because every sin has to be faced with god but this boy imagine that when you compare me with him i'm so much better a woman named Joyce Urch was blinded by a hereditary illness. So for 26 years, she couldn't see. 26 long years. She had five kids. She had 12 grandchildren. She had three great-grandchildren. Most of them she only knew by hearing and touch. 26 years. Then she was rushed to the hospital with chest pains. And while she was in the hospital, this blind woman had a serious heart attack combined with serious kidney failure. The doctors did not expect her to live. However, she went through what turned out to be a life saving operation. She came through the surgery. She was asleep in her bed in the intensive care unit, her husband and just the Immediate family members, some of them were there when Joyce Church woke up. And when she woke up and opened her eyes, her first words to her family were, I can see. I can see. Now, whatever happened in that surgery, her sight was bad. But her husband didn't believe it. He said, you can see. Okay, if you can see, he said, what color sweater am I wearing? And she kind of moved her head a little and she said, you're wearing it. Oh my, she said, haven't you gotten old? <laughs> and he said, wait till you look in the mirror. She hadn't seen herself for 26 years. So she could very easily see that he had aged. She wasn't so quick to see that she had aged. We are very quick to see where others have sinned. We're very slow to see why we have sinned. That's this man. That's this boy. Who wanted to live or at least in his mind was living as if he had no guilt he felt that his service and how he had lived that this was all something that put him just a notch closer to heaven and certainly leagues apart from a sinner like this boy now did you hear what we sang and did you know what we read christ receives sinners if there's a good person in the tent tonight i need to tell you that christ receives sinners not good people because there are no good people however there are people who think they're good and that often keeps a person from coming to the lord jesus so notice please the differing conclusion how how it ended the prodigal son found forgiveness forgiveness he comes home to admit that he has sinned and he receives forgiveness now forgiveness is the greatest blessing that can come to a human being there is nothing that compares with this. If you have forgiveness, then you have something that money could not buy. You have something that could only come from God, and you have something that can never be taken from you. Forgiveness. That's what the boy received. That's what I received on that July night in 1966. Only God could forgive me, and God is the one who did. And I can quote the language of the New Testament and tell you that I have forgiveness through Christ's blood the forgiveness of sins, redemption through his blood. So the boy comes home and obtains this great blessing forgiveness. Do you know why God is offering forgiveness to you tonight? Do you know why God can forgive you tonight? It's because the man who came here to receive sinners went to a cross to die for sinners. 
First Corinthians 15 tells us Christ died for our sins. Romans 5 tells us Christ died for the ungodly. The verse that my dear brother read to us on Sunday night was that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And then did you note the next phrase in that verse? Because it was life changing, wasn't it? What they came to understand about the death of Christ completely changed their outlook. They had admitted earlier in the chapter they didn't know who Jesus was and they didn't know why he died. As soon as they found out that he was wounded for our transgressions, they said, with his stripes, we're saved because they had discovered what happened on the cross. That is why God can offer you forgiveness tonight. Because his son came into the world to save sinners. So if there are any sinners in the tent tonight, Christ is here tonight to receive you and he will save you because he died for you. You'll notice that the prodigal enjoyed a feast. <laughs> The before and after picture in the chapter is staggering. When you think of the famine in the far off land as he's trying to, to, to fill his, 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 his stomach with the husks that he's feeding to the swine and the, the gnawing hunger awakens him to the fact that he's dying, that he's perishing. Now the, the after picture is of the boy in the house dressed in the best robe, sitting with his father at the table. The tables are groaning with the food. And he's enjoying a feast. He has gone from a, a mighty famine to a merry feast in the father's house because he is picturing for us the spiritual satisfaction that belongs to people that Christ receives. Our world is a pretty empty place when it comes to finding anything for your soul. There's plenty to meet your physical needs. But there's a famine in our world when it comes to meeting the deep needs of your soul. But if you came to Christ tonight, you'd get your first taste of what the Lord Jesus describes as a feast of the rich blessings that God has. And, and of course, he experienced the father's joy. This is not the parable of the prodigal son. This is the parable of the gracious father. Just read the parable, parable for yourself when you have a chance, or at least that third part of it. And you'll notice it's all from the viewpoint of the father. It's not. His elder brother, it's the elder son, was in the field that he came because it's the father, right? And so it is a picture. It's a portrait of God. And when you see that boy and that father, and you remember that throughout the chapter, the idea of joy and rejoicing and happiness is, is throbbing and pulsating. You realize that salvation and being with God and living with God forever is the most joyous experience that a human being can have. Let me ask you to try to put yourself into the position of the parents I'm about to tell you about. In 2004, a 22 month old baby boy named Logan wandered away from his babysitter. This was in Boise, Idaho and fell into a canal. That little boy, was submerged for practically half an hour, 30 minutes. A policeman pulled him out. The officer gave him CPR. Emergency workers came. They did everything they could to revive him. Nothing. The boy was pronounced dead. His parents were allowed a few minutes at the hospital with the body. As the nurse would soon be preparing the body to go to the funeral. She left them alone. Put yourself in their position. Your 22 month old boy is lying there dead. They said their goodbyes. The nurse came in. She began to work around the body. And then she noticed the chest was slightly moving. And the boy was alive. Now you're the parents. You've gotten in your car. You, you're the father. You're trying to hold your emotions in because you're a male and you're doing the best you can. Your wife, she's not driving, so she's sitting there. The tears are flowing. And the phone rings. Come back. Logan's alive. He was dead and now he's alive. How would you feel? How would you feel? That was your boy. 
That's what's in the chapter. Because the Lord Jesus is telling us about how God feels when a sinner is received by Christ. And the father says, this my son was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost. Now he's found. And that's why there's this wonderful scene of joy and rejoicing and the feast and the, the son brought into the house. Because the Lord Jesus is telling us that this is what God loves to do. He loves to save sinners. This is what the Lord Jesus loves to do. He loves to receive sinners. Nothing would give God greater joy as far as you are concerned than if you were to come to Christ tonight and trust him. But as I close, will you notice that the proud son resented the grace his father had shown him? Sure, he hated his brother, but it was his father that he resented. You never gave me a kid that I might make merry with you. No, no. No, he wasn't interested in having a feast in the house with his father. He said, you never gave me a kid that I could make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, your son's come, you kill for him the fatted calf. What he resented was the grace that his father had shown to his sin. What the Pharisees and scribes resented was that the Lord Jesus was companying with sinners instead of complimenting them for their good life. But of course, when the story comes to its conclusion, this resentful, angry, self-righteous young man is outside of all that joy completely. Now, we saw this once before, didn't we? We read the Bible from the beginning. We saw, we saw a brother who rose up and killed his own brother. But what he really resented was God. That God had received Abel's offering and not his and so his anger against God was expressed in how he treated his brother. And the Lord Jesus is telling us about people who think so highly of themselves that they really don't think they need a savior, that they really don't need a shepherd to find them, that they really don't need the spirit of God to move things out of their life so that they can be saved, that they don't need to come back and confess that they are sinners. I hope tonight that there's no one in the tent like that. And as my dear brother preaches the gospel further, I hope that there are some people here tonight who know I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And Christ receives sinners. First Corinthians, please, and chapter number one. <clears throat> Follow on with what you've already heard. Thank you to everyone who's come out to hear the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 22. <clears throat> For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, wisdom of God. It is the beginning of verse 23 that I want to notice for this uh, ending portion of the meeting. But we preach Christ crucified. That's what we're going to notice just at the close. <laughs> Perhaps you have wondered a little bit why Mr. Higgins has opened to a passage of scripture 2,000 years old, at least. Why have we not come to a tent like this in 2021 with a post-pandemic orchestrated message? If it's right to call it post-pandemic yet, I'm not sure. But why have we not come with that? Why have we not come with some special, significant message so calculated for the post-COVID world? Because, friends, the message that you need to hear is a message that's very old. And we are not... New uh, preachers with new messages. We come with one message. This is what it is. We preach Christ crucified. The only hope for men and women, even today. Your only hope, my friend. I'm sorry if I knocked this down. But your only hope, your only hope is understanding what is involved in this great event. Christ crucified. That's what we do. We <laughs> preach it. The word used here for preaching uh, as others would tell you, is the word for heralding it forth. 
It is the word for announcing it, broadcasting it, declaring it. And it's the idea of saying it with authority, not any authority that I have, not any authority that I have because I have special letters after my name. And by the way, no amount of letters after the name would give me any authority, not discouraging those who would take studying the Bible or anything else seriously, but that would give me no authority. The authority comes from the word of God and from the God we represent. This very uh, uh, letter would tell us in the second epistle that we are ambassadors for Christ. It is him making his appeal through us. We are merely the messengers. We are merely the deliverers of this message. What message? We preach Christ crucified. That's the gospel. Christ crucified. So what's so special about it? Why is it that that's what you need to hear and not something about how to live now that some of you haven't seen smiles and never mind, it's been here in Jersey. What's so special about this old ancient message, Christ crucified? Well, let me just explain it to you very simply in the next few minutes. First of all, I want you to notice who, who's being preached. It's Christ. Who is Christ? Mr. Higgins has told us that a lot of people confuse the issue of sin. They judge it by them, their own mind, their own standard, what they think about sin, whether they're bad or, or not that bad. You know, I've met a number of people in the last couple of years who have a very strange idea of Christ. I met a man who told me that Jesus is whoever you want him to be. It's like a spiritual idea. You make Christ. You make him suit whatever you need him to suit. That's Christ. I have to tell you just simply that Christ was a historical figure. That he came from heaven. That Jesus Christ was the son of God. He was eternal and co-equal with the father. In that very chapter in Luke 15, he is pictured as the shepherd that goes searching uh, for the sheep. Christ came into this world, truly God. He became a actual, real man like us, apart from sin. You say, I, I know that. I've heard people say different confessions. Why is that so important? Friends, the reason it's so important, listen, there's no salvation if he's not God. And there's no salvation if he's not a man. You see, your sin, my sin, it has separated us from God. For a bridge to connect us to God, the bridge has to touch both sides. That's what a bridge does. The bridge has to touch God. And Christ became a man so that the bridge could touch men. And on the cross, he dealt with sin. And so it is vitally important that who we preach is not ourselves. We preach Christ, but not just we preach Christ. We don't just preach about his incarnation. We don't just preach the Christmas story. It says, we preach Christ crucified. We preach the cross. Why? You've already heard it tonight. Because that is how, that is how this man can receive sinners. It is through what he did on the cross in dealing with sin. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about the cross. Some people think it's just a very sad story. What they did to him. When they didn't even give him the dignity of hanging with his own clothes on. And they spit on his face. Some people think he was the victim of circumstances. Judas's kiss. Pilate's waffling character. All of it coming together in a, a perfect storm. And it just happened to him. I want you to understand this. Please understand this. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. Jesus died by his own choice. He died as an act of his own will. Listen to what he says. No man takes my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it again. He came to give his life a ransom for many. There were at least two occasions where they tried to take his life. One time they tried to push him over a cliff, over the brow of a hill. They couldn't do it because his hour had not come. Another time they picked up stones, the Bible says, to stone him. But they couldn't do that because his hour had not come. So you see, if, if Christ is actually being crucified, he is not there as a victim of circumstance. He is not there because the storm just fell on him and, and he had no option in it. No, just before he actually was arrested, 
And, and one of his disciples picked up the sword. He says, do you not know I have authority right now? The penniless man from Nazareth. I have authority to call 12 legions of angels. Do you remember what two angels did to Sodom and Gomorrah? In the garden, a penniless man from Nazareth. The village carpenter says, I have authority to call 12 legions, thousands of angels. You see, he is there being crucified violently, nails through his hands and feet because of his choice, his will. He wanted to go there. And so that's the question. Like, why? Why? Why does he want to go to the cross? Everyone else would, would turn away from the cross. He wants to go there for you, my friend. He wanted to go there for me. Because if he would not have gone there, he could never have received me. And he could never have received you. He went to the cross out of obedience to his father for you. And so we preach Christ crucified. The message, uh, and just three, three simple things tonight. The message exposes what God thinks about sin. This will fit in nicely with what we've already heard. It exposes what God thinks about sin. I don't know what you think about sin. I was preaching somewhere not too long ago and speaking about sin. And after going through it a few nights, I came to understand somebody didn't even know what sin is. So let me just be simple and explain to you what sin is. Sin is disobeying God. Sin is God has a standard and we fall short of it. We miss it. Sin is when we, when we miss it by doing things that God tells us not to do. You've heard some of those already tonight. Lying, pride, theft, murder. But sin, missing God's standard, is by failing to do what God has told us to do. He has told every one of us in this tent tonight, all of us, including myself, that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart. He has told us to worship him and to praise him and to honor him and to love our neighbor as ourself. God has desired for my life and for yours that from the rising of the sun today to its setting, that his name was to be praised. Now, have you done that? If you haven't, I'll tell you what you've done. You've missed the standard. You've sinned. And so have I. But, but what do you think about sin? What do you think about lying? What do you think about cheating or swearing? You know, for about five years of my life, I worked in a suicide unit in a mental health facility in a hospital about 20 minutes from where I lived um, alongside some psychiatrists and um, nurses, specifically dealing with people who had tried to take their own life. And uh, the first time I came into the little meeting where the nurse would explain what was happening and we would go through every single patient who was there, all 25 beds, and they would explain what they did, why they were here. I remember being absolutely shocked. This is not in um, some rundown community. This was in a very affluent community, not too much different than where we are just now. And I was shocked at how depressed and discouraged people were and the kinds of life stories they had, the kinds of things that people, no older than some of you girls here tonight and some of you boys that, that they had already been through in their life. And you don't need to be an emotional person. It would have been something to bring tears out of, a, out of concrete. The kind of things that people have been through. <coughs> that was the first night. Well, five years later, I sat in the meeting and it hardly faced me. You get desensitized, right? You see the same thing. You hear the same story. It's a different name. It's a different person, but it's the same story, and you just get used to it. You know, that's how it is with sin. You and I, we've gotten used to lying. Everyone lies. We've gotten used to swearing. You pull up on the street, and somebody passes by you, and they're blasting music, and there's cursing in it. We're used to that. God's never gotten used to it. God has never gotten accustomed. God has never softened to it. 
And if you want to know where can we find what God thinks about sin, where can we see how, how he feels about it? You could go to a garden, the Garden of Eden. You could go to what happened in the world when, when God sent fire from heaven in Sodom and Gomorrah or even the flood and the ark in Noah's day. But if you want to know where God has shown clearly what he thinks about sin, you must come to a cross. Outside the city of Jerusalem. Where a man is hanging on the cross with nails through his hands and feet. And he is being crushed. And wave after wave is falling on this man for sin. And God is pouring out all of his anger, all of his wrath against sin. The Bible says it like this. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He was treated as if he were sin itself. If I understand that verse correctly, the man you heard about tonight, who was that mass murderer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless son of God, was treated as if he were that man. Crushed for sin, sin he never did, but all of God's hatred, lying, cheating, Theft, murder, pride, funneled on a cross. That's what God thinks about sin. That's what he thinks about my sin. He is angry with it. I need you to understand that, friend. God has not gotten used to it. He is angry with it. And so the cross exposes what God sees and thinks about sin. It exposes what he sees about ourselves. <clears throat> you and I as human beings with this problem of sin, that has separated us from God, we are absolutely, utterly helpless to do anything about it. There is nothing like that. Please, I'm just pleading with you as if you were myself. There is absolutely nothing you can do as a dealer person. You cannot pray enough. You cannot go to church enough. You cannot say you're sorry enough. You cannot change your life enough. You cannot believe enough. You cannot try enough. The reason it's Christ crucified is because we were totally helpless. And it took just that. It took God himself coming into this world, going to a cross. That's how utterly impotent and, and helpless we all were. We cannot ever, by our own efforts and our own schemes and our own intelligence, work our way back to God. We can never do it. We are lost, helpless people. And the cross, that's where we, we see what God thinks about our sin and what God thinks about ourselves. How helpless we are. Totally helpless. Nothing we can do. And so you say, well, why preach that? Why, why preach Christ crucified? If it just tells us all about our sin and then it tells us all about our helplessness, well, sure. It's going to leave a whole bunch of people going home feeling rather sad. And these meetings are good news meetings, are they not? Meetings for the gospel. Well, because it's the same cross and the same person on the cross that is the answer to the whole thing. You see, the reason he's there is for our sin. The reason he's there is because we couldn't do it. That's why he's there. That's why he's on the cross. It's because we were sinful and because we were helpless. And so Christ crucified not only exposes what God thinks about sin, but it expresses what God has found in his son on that cross. You know, when the Lord Jesus went to the cross, according to Philippians chapter 2, he did it out of obedience to his father. The Bible says this, he became obedient even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Mm -hmm. And so he was there out of obedience to God. The Bible also says that when he went to the cross, he went there for our sin. You've heard that already quoted tonight in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died for our sin. You see, what he was doing on that cross, lifted up between heaven and earth, was he was offering to God the only payment possible. To deal with sin. The Bible says this. The soul that sins. 
must die. The wages of sin is death. The Bible says that the person who broke the law is cursed. And the way to deal with the curse is cursed as everyone who hangs on a tree. This was our portion. This was where we stand. This is where we line up. This is what we deserve. And a sinless man stood in our place. And he went to the cross and says so simply, Christ died for our sin. Christ once suffered for sin, the perfect one, the just one, for the unjust, for you and I, that he might bring us to God. And so on the cross, put so simply in Isaiah 53, he was being wounded for our sins, crushed for those. And whatever he did on the cross, it was enough. Not only did he say it is finished at the end, the Bible makes it so clear. And in 1 Peter 2, it says that he bore our sin and his body on the cross. Now, you know this much. I am looking at you here tonight. Many of you already, you would know this much. There's no sin in heaven. So if Jesus is bearing our sin on the cross, and yet today he's in heaven, then whatever he did on that cross, I settled sin. If he's bearing our sin in his body on that cross, and yet in that body, he's in heaven today, then whatever happened on the cross, whether you can understand what it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whether you can understand what it means when it says it is finished, whatever he did on the cross, God has said, I'm satisfied with it. Because in Christ crucified, what, is not, what has happened is not only has sin been settled, not only has he suffered for sin and died for sin, but on the third day he rose again. God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead showing, I am satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. God is saying, in Christ crucified. We preach it today, even I was thinking about this this morning. We preach it to the pleasure of God today. God delights to hear. Christ crucified. Because in that cross that has never grown stale or crusty to the Lord God, he has received satisfaction for sin. Sin that has broken homes. Sin that has broken lives. It's all been dealt with and settled. Even the sin that has so uh, affected this world in that cross. God raised him from the dead, showing I'm satisfied with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing left. Nothing left to do. He's done it all. And so it exposes God's hatred of sin. That's what, that's what you can see if you come to the cross. But it expresses his pleasure for sin. I read a verse in the book of Isaiah just the other day, and uh, it said this. It was talking about the day when the Lord would come and judge the nations. But it said this. Behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. But there's coming a day when the Lord is going to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their sin. What happened on the cross was the Lord came out of his place to take the punishment for the inhabitants of the earth for our sin. He was there very simply tonight. He was there as our substitute. And that is offered by God as a gift. You cannot earn it. You, if, you, if you are here tonight and you are trying to believe you are trying to earn. You cannot earn. You cannot work for it. You can never deserve it. You can never deserve a gift. All you can do with a gift is receive it. With an empty hand and a grateful heart. That is what's being offered. What he did for sin, credited to my, my sin, my account. Credited. It counts for me. It counts for my sin. You see, Mr. Higgins and I, we already told you on Sunday night how we were saved. You know, it's not, a, it's not that I have done something or I've worn the right clothes or joined the right church. That somehow God is looking at me and all my sins that I've done. And he says, well, you've done now your part. 
And so I won't have to punish your sin. No, the reason I will never face the punishment is because my sins have already been punished on the cross. That was credited to my account on March the 22nd of 2003. I received it as a bankrupt, helpless, prodigal, guilty, sinner as a gift. And what a wonder that the day I came, he ran to give it to me. That's amazing. He ran to welcome. And he would do the same for those here tonight. And so Christ crucified, it expresses God's hatred of sin. It expresses God's satisfaction alone in Christ. It can be yours tonight. You can receive that credited to your account for your sins, whatever they may be. We don't need to know them. God knows them. You know them. You can, you can have what he did credited to your account as a gift. The one thing Christ crucified also does is it excludes <coughs> indifference. You know, when things are announced sometimes like this, when they're preached or announced or declared, Sometimes there can be relative indifference. On my way here, we stopped and I suppose where Mr. Higgins is from, the city of Philadelphia, and there were different people giving presentations about Benjamin Franklin and about famous people who live there. And some people listen very attentively. They want to know about this person and they maybe want to model their life after this person. And other people are listening maybe from a different angle, but most people are just relatively indifferent, just here for the tour. You know, when it comes to Christ crucified, no one leaves indifferent. No one, no one who is here in this tent tonight. You see, what is being offered tonight is this man who receives sinners. And that is accepted as a gift or rejected. And there's no in between. Right? When a gift is offered, if I offered you a gift today, you either take it and accept it. Or however politely you may do it, you reject it. And there's the only, two, only the two options. It is this message, Christ crucified. It excludes indifference. No one can leave just, I'll think about it. Uh, I'm interested. No, friend. You either, and I'm not trying to put any kind of a sales pitch or pressure tactic. Listen, you either leave as a recipient of this person who forgives sin, who settled it all on the cross, or you leave as a rejecter of Christ. And just before I close, can I just tell you solemnly that there is a hell and a lake of fire for rejectors of Christ. I just read it just the other day, Revelation 20, the small, the great standing before God, the books are opened in that great white throne. As I was thinking about this verse, I just thought to myself, the last message, the last gospel message a person will hear before being cast into the lake of fire is the sight of a throne, a man with wounded hands. The last message, Christ. Crucified, but rejected. Friend, today he's offered to you as a gift.